Okay. You know, years ago, they used to have those pictures that were up to dots and you get it and it'd be a landscape. And then you're told to look for it even closer and see if you could see a dinosaur or a bear or a bird or something like that. And I would stare at those pictures and stare at those pictures. And then all of a sudden out came this picture of a, a, a this white area, this clear area that was an animal. And if you just went by the picture, you wouldn't pay attention to it. Tonight's lesson is going to look at the crucifixion of Christ from a perspective of not looking at the obvious, but looking at what's behind the obvious to see the glory of Jesus in his death. And you, you hard, like Pastor said, it's hard to take a subject like the crucifixion of Christ and look at it from a standpoint of being happy about it. But in one respect, it's what God ordained. It's what God and Jesus and the Trinity planned so that mankind could be redeemed and reconciled to God and have a relationship in eternity with him. And so when we look at the crucifixion, it's a culmination of God's redemptive plan. And so we're going to focus on the how these other issues, these things that are behind the scenes, behind the obvious, um, really d demonstrate the glory of Jesus as a son of God. We're going to also pick up, and not only I've asked you to look at the four gospels and their narrative about the crucifixion, this is the third lesson that I've asked you to do this, but we're also going to go into the book of Hebrews and chapter nine and talk about some of the significance of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Uh, in a review of previous lessons, and I have to excuse myself, I've got one good eye and one bad eye, so hard to read because I don't have the perception. So if I look like I have paper in front of my face, I do. <laughs> so this was taken into custody, arrested during the early morning hours on the Friday before the celebration of Passover later that evening. He was arrested by our soldiers and officials that were sent by the high priest and the Pharisees and led to the Garden of Gethsemane by Judas, who had taken over by Satan, received a bribe in order to betray Jesus. Now, learn that Jesus purposely allowed himself to be arrested in order to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies and God's will to complete God's plan of redemption and salvation. Jesus was then taken before the Jewish leaders, who, after three separate hearings, determined that Jesus was guilty of blasphemy and sentenced Jesus to death, even though Jesus had not committed any crime whatsoever, and Jesus was telling the truth about being the Son of God. Because the religious leaders did not want to be held responsible for putting Jesus to death on the eve of Passover, they decided to take Jesus to the Roman governor Pilate, demanding that Pilate have Jesus executed under Roman law, where he would be crucified, instead of under Levitical law, where he would be thrown down and stoned. To death. After examining Jesus, Pilate told the religious who brought Jesus to him, he found no basis whatsoever for executing Jesus. However, the religious leaders continued to pressure Pilate to carry off their demands to crucify Jesus. When Pilate learned that Jesus was from Galilee, which was under the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas, he sent Jesus to Herod. Before Herod, Jesus was really mocked. Herod was not interested in whether who Jesus really was. He just wanted to be entertained. He was looking for Jesus to perform miracles for him. Jesus remained silent and did not respond to Herod. And Herod put on a royal robe, ridiculed Jesus by dressing him in this robe in Jesus and having his soldiers strike him in the face before sending him back to Pilate. Pilate attempted to avoid being held responsible for deciding Jesus' fate by sending Jesus to Herod, but that didn't succeed. And he, this was before him a second time. Finding that Jesus had not committed any offense which merited Jesus being crucified, 
Pilate again attempted to avoid responsibility for crucifying Jesus. But pressured by the Jews who were blackmailing him about going over his head to Caesar, forced Pilate to give in to their demands. And Pilate then handed Jesus over to be crucified. Now, remember, both on Jewish law and Roman law, there had to be at least two days between a judgment and sentence and the execution of the judgment and sentence. Jesus was not allowed under Jewish law or Roma two days. They immediately turned him over to the Roman guards to be crucified. So, and the, having reached the point where Pilate turned Jesus over to his Roman soldiers to crucify Jesus, we have been spending the last few weeks talking about the crucifixion of Christ. Um, in the first lesson about the crucifixion of Jesus, we focused on how the events surrounding the crucifixion of Christ fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Tonight, there's going to be a couple of other Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled by the death of Jesus. In the second lesson about the crucifixion of Jesus, we focused on the three hours of darkness from noon to three o'clock in the afternoon when God poured out his wrath, his and his punishment on Jesus who took upon himself this of all those who God called unto salvation. Tonight's lesson is the third and the final lesson about Jesus and his crucifixion. When we think about the crucifixion, we're inclined to focus on the obvious, the physical suffering of Christ, Christ taking on himself the wrath of God, and finally his death. In doing so, we often overlook other events which took place while Christ was on the cross and immediately after Christ surrenders life to death. These events not only reveal the glory of Jesus as the Son of God sent for our salvation from the wrath of God, but manifest Jesus' power and sovereignty, his love and the completion of his earthly ministry of love. And I already mentioned it reminds tonight's last added me of those pictures where you would look at it and you'd see a landscape, but if you look closer, out from the picture came a sacred or uh, pick of uh, an animal or a bird. So tonight we're going to focus on the other events surrounding the crucifixion of, of Christ, which may not be as obvious as the crucifixion itself. The main message that I want you to get from tonight's lesson is that Jesus's actions on the cross demonstrated his glory, power, and sovereignty over his own death, which combined with the natural phenomena occurred before and after Jesus' death bore witness to his divine nature and his divine purpose in finishing God's redemptive plan. The outline, uh, the study itself is going to be by not emphasizing Jesus' suffering, pain, and humility and the wrath of God while he was being crucified, the Gospels emphasize the glory, power, and sovereignty of Jesus over his own death. So we're going to break it down into three parts. By calling out and sur surrendering his spirit, Jesus demonstrated his power and sovereignty over his own death. The second part we're going to talk about is the miraculous signs which took place before and after Jesus' death bore witness to his divine nature. Third, we're going to talk about Jesus' death ended the Old Testament sacrificial system and gave direct access to God and salvation to those who believe. And then we're getting discussion questions that are going to expand our understanding of what we're going to talk about tonight. So let's get into the study itself. By not emphasizing Jesus' suffering, pain, humility, and the wrath of God while he was being crucified, the Gospels emphasize the glory, power, and sovereignty of Jesus over his own death. So the first son is by calling out and surrendering his spirit, Jesus demonstrated his power and sovereignty over his own death. We're going to read from Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 37. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. The one man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it under his stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if it should be Elijah, not Elisha. I'm sorry, it's misspelled there. Comes to take down. 
with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. In John 19, verses 28 through 30, covering the same time period, later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, as we discussed before, death by crucifixion involves a slow, painful death where the prisoner suffers from exposure, dehydration, heart failure, and finally suffocation. During the process of being crucified, as you're hanging on the cross, in order to be able to breathe, it gets harder and harder. You have to push feet that are nailed down to wood and cross and that's a painful effort, but, but you have to lift yourself up so you can breathe. And so th that got tiring. The person got dehydrated. Ultimately, he lost, he was so feeble, he couldn't even have the strength to push himself and he would just finally suffocate to death. Toward the end, the prayer on the cross becomes completely helpless, feeble, weak, and listless. Many on the cross approached insanity and no longer able to speak or interact with anything around them. They just lapsed into their own world before they suffocated and died. Most prisoners who, who were crucified took days to succumb to their eventual death. Jesus died after being on the cross for six hours. Even Pontius Pilate was surprised that Jesus had died. In Mark chapter 15, verses 42 to 44, it was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. Two prisoners being crucified next to Jesus were still alive and more likely would have survived for another day ago. In order to hasten the death of the two other prisoners, the Roman soldiers were required to use a large wooden mallet, and they would slam and break the femurs of the prisoners that were on the cross so they could no longer lift themselves upon, up on, in order to breathe and would quickly come to suffocation. John 19, 31 through 33 talks about this. Now it was a day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath a Sabbath which followed the celebration of Passover. The Jews did not want the bodies left the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. One of the arguments that they say that Jesus was never resurrected is the argument Jesus never died on the cross. He never died the first. The scriptures clearly indicate that Jesus died on the cross. As we'll talk about later, these Roman soldiers were used to crucifixion. They were soldiers that were used to giving up death, and they were well able to recognize when somebody was dead and when they weren't. They came to Jesus they found that he was already dead. These, these Roman soldiers knew what death looked like, and Jesus had died on the cross. So instead of breaking Jesus' bones, the Roman guards pierced his side, fulfilling prophecy that no bones of the Messiah would be broken and that his side would be pierced. Again, even in his death, the fulfillment of prophecy was accomplished by what happened on the cross. Now, this is the important thing that's hidden in what we just read. Rather than showing weakness before dying, Jesus demonstrated his divine power and sovereignty over his own death, crying out in a loud voice, I am thirsty. And then after tasting the moniker, which was given to him in a sponge attached to a stalk of hot up, crying out in a loud voice, it is finished. And then by calling out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. A person 
that's been on the cross that is close to death would never be able to cry out. But the scriptures are very clear that Jesus cried out so that everybody could hear him. He cried out, and scriptures say he cried out in a loud voice. This shows that Jesus was really not close to death, that Jesus was still divine in his power, controlling the, and having sovereignty over his own life and death. The apostle John then wrote, with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus was not, did not let himself be killed by men. He had the authority to take his own life and to give it back. And this is the scriptures because when Jesus was telling his disciples that he was a good shepherd, if you recall, he said that no one would ever be able to take his life from him, but that only he had the authority to lay down his life. In John 10 verses 17 through 18, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life and only to take it up again. No one took it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Jesus is clearly indicating what would happen on the cross and what in fact happened, that Jesus allowed his spirit to be released of his own accord. And so the crying out loud, his bow is dead down and giving up his spirit are all indications of his divine sovereignty over his own life and death. Uh, Before Pilate, Jesus said that Pilate would not have any power over Jesus if it had not been given to him from above. Pilate asked, do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Jesus is talking about divine power, divine power demonstrated in his giving up on his own accord, his life on the cross. Now, in addition to that, the miraculous signs and events before and after Jesus' death bore witness to his divine nature. The Roman soldiers who were responsible for crucifying Jesus, as I mentioned before, were experts in administering that cruel form of punishment. They had ministered death by crucifixion numerous times and had vast experience in watching prisoners suffer as they solely succumbed to death. Never before had they had witnessed the miraculous sign of three hours of darkness taking place in the middle of the day before Jesus died, nor had they witnessed the earthquakes which followed. Two miraculous events that took place three hours of darkness at noon during the midpoint of the day and followed by jesus's death in an earthquake nor had the roman guards ever witnessed a person being crucified being give testimony about another about another person being crucified receiving a promise of being with christ in paradise after he died jesus had said when he first was placed on the cross father forgive them for they do not know what they're doing he was talking about the roman soldiers that were crucifying and asked god to forgive them two prisoners that were being crucified with jesus were hurling insult at jesus just like all the rest of them but one of them during that changed his tune he looked at jesus and he said to the other prisoner Jesus doesn't deserve to be crucified. We do. We're criminals. And then he asked, Jesus, remember me. Jesus, that was a plea for salvation and a repentance, recognizing his own sin. Jesus said, surely today you'll be in paradise with me. Jesus gave witness on the cross to the salvation of the prisoner while he himself was dying on the cross. Then the last thing, Ignored Roman soldiers ever witness a person who was about to die on the cross being able to cry out in a loud voice the words spoken by Jesus immediately before he surrendered his life. All of these things that Jesus did on the cross, they were being observed by the Roman centurion and the guards that were guarding Jesus. Now they watched a lot of people die, and that's not what people do when they die on the cross. They suffer. They become listless. They're not concerned about anybody else. They go into their own world. Yet Jesus did everything different dying on the cross. 
And so when Jesus died, he surrendered his life. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. That was from Luke 23, 7. In Matthew 27, verse 54, when the centurion and those with him who were God, Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. The very nature of what happened during the crucifixion bore witness that Jesus was the son of God. And the Roman guards, having all their expertise in watching people die on the cross, proclaimed that this is unusual. The earthquake's unusual. And in terror, they said, surely this man is the son of God. Even the, Now we go to one more step that shows the divinity of Christ during his crucifixion. Even the crowd who witnessed Jesus' crucifixion had second thought about Jesus' divine nature. Reading from Luke 23, verse 48, when all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away, pounding their breasts. That's a sign of regret, of, of a second thought about who Jesus was the time that jesus was on the cross the crowd was mocking jesus saying maybe elijah will rest elijah will come and rescue you from the cross let's give you more wine vinegar so that maybe we can prolong your life and see elijah come and rescue you or if you're god why don't you come down from the cross yourself they're mocking him but when jesus and the earthquake and all these have, have crowd left away pounding their chest so anyway, the um, before, as I mentioned, before the crowd that had gathered around the cross beforehand, they mocked and insulted Jesus. In Mark 15, verse 29 through 30, the scriptures say, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself again. After observing everything that happened, the crowd left with second thought in their mind, beating their own chest. How much more evidence do we need from the gospel of the divine nature and the glory of Christ being shown on the cross by not what Jesus did in giving salvation to one of the prisoners, by Jesus crying out loud before he died, the miraculous events that occurred surrounding his death the crowd after seeing all this they begin to have set thoughts about who jesus was and the roman guards themselves said see this is surely the son of god so with that we get to the last part of our lesson in that Jesus's death ended the Old Testament sacrificial system and gave direct access to God and salvation to those who believe. After Jesus surrendered his spirit and died, the curtain at the temple was torn apart from top to bottom. Um, it was three o'clock in the afternoon. Why is that important on this particular day? It's because the priests were back at the temple slaughtering all the lambs that would be used by the families that were from Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. So they were busy sacrificing lambs. And that from three to six is when they did these, they slaughtered the lambs for the Passover feast. Who died at three o'clock? Jesus Christ. He is the Passover lamb. Um, Amen. Jesus as the scriptures say, Jesus was a lamb of God sacrificed once and for all to atone for the sins of those who believed in him. So God's wrath, judgment, and punishment for sin would pass over them that they would receive eternal life. The tearing of the veil in the temple symbolized the elimination of the Old Testament sacrificial system and open direct access to God for all those who believe. When Jesus died and the curtain between the holy and the most holy was torn open. That be, even before the end of the temple, as far as the Old Testament sacrificial system, it was no longer useful. It was gone. Jesus replaced it by being the Lamb of God, sacrificed to atone for the sins of mankind. Now we're going to read from Hebrews, which talks about the 
end of the Old Testament system by Jesus' death on the cross. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain, this is the curtain that was torn after Jesus died, was a, was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained a gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. That was the mercy seat. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the other room to carry on their ministry. And only the high priest entered the inner room, and only that once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing this by this, that the way to the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, in indicating the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They're only a manner of food, drink, and various ceremonial washings, eternal regulations applying until the time of the new order. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer spilled on those who are ceremonial clean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so we may serve the living God. Hebrews puts it all together. By dying on the cross, Jesus ended the Old Testament sacrificial system. There was no more a need to sacrifice animals. All of that was an illustration of what was to come. And that was Jesus dying on the cross as a lamb of God. Now, in addition to the cru curtain in the temple being torn apart from top to bottom, the apostle Matthew reported that the earth shook rock split and the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. So in Matthew 27 verses 50 to 53, Matthew reports, and when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up the spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rock split. The tombs were broken open, and the bodies of many holy people who died were raised to life. They came out of their tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So here we have another phenomena, a miracle of people that had passed away and were buried in their tombs, the earthquake coming out of their tombs and coming into the city of Jerusalem when Jesus was resurrected. The raising of the previously deceased holy ones was a preview of the eternal life to come for all believers. It also affirmed that Jesus died for the salvation of those who believed in the promises of God before Jesus was sent to, earth to fill, fulfill God's redemptive plan. The very fact that people that died before Jesus even came to earth proves that Jesus died for the sins of those holy people that were called by God to salvation when Jesus came. And that that gets to another discussion that I want to go into a lot of detail is when Jesus died, where'd he go? He told the he told the other criminal on the cross, today you'll see me in paradise. In paradise are the souls of those that are waiting the resurrection of the body that uh, will ultimately be permanently sharing eternal life in heaven itself. And so Jesus was in paradise with those souls that had died or awaiting the permanent eter eternal life that comes with being in heaven. So what we did tonight 
is we took a look at some of the lesser obvious events that surrounded the death of Jesus on the cross. We focused on how the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled. We focused on Jesus bearing the wrath, judgment, and punishment of God during the three hours of darkness. And now we focused on the other things that took place surrounding Jesus's death. All of these things demonstrated that Jesus was God. It did demonstrate his divine nature. His manner of death on the cross reflected his divine power and sovereignty over life and death. The nature of the earthquake and the other, the darkness and the other events, the bodies coming out of the tomb, the rain of the curtain, all those miraculous signs all pointed to Jesus's divine power and his glory and his fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies inaugurating in the New Testament, the New Covenant. So with that, we come to our lesson, and now we're going to get into the discussion questions that are going to allow us to elaborate on what we learned. Oh, no. Oh. While he was on the cross, Jesus asked God to forgive those who were crucifying him. By asking God to forgive those who were crucifying him, Jesus prompted one of the criminals next to him to say to the other criminal that Jesus did not deserve being crucified and to ask Jesus to remember him, leading to his salvation. Jesus also lovingly asked John to take care of his mother, bearing witness to his divine love and compassion even while he was suffering. The natural phenomena which took place as Jesus suffered on the cross the three hours of darkness, the earthquake, the opening of the tombs, all bore witness to the divine nature of Christ, which caused the Roman centurion to declare the divinity of Christ. It also caused the crowd who had previously been mocking Jesus to be as they walked away after Jesus had given up his spirit, opened the door to their receiving salvation when Jesus was resurrected and Peter at Pentecost explained who Jesus was. Jesus' display of his extraordinary strength to cry out loud that his redemptive work was finished and to surrender his spirit demonstrated his power and sovereignty over his own life and death. Taken all together, the events that surrounded Jesus' death demonstrated Jesus' divine nature and manifested his glory as the Son of God who obediently completed God's redemptive plan. Amen. Well done. Okay.